Excuse me, fat boy. <laughs> Twelve messed up scariest Stephen King monsters. The world of horror literature in movies wouldn't be the same without the presence of Stephen King. The horror legend has cooked up some of the most terrifying villains and monsters that come with the creepiest plots and ideas. What makes them so scary is the fact that King knows the art of weaving a maze of suspense around the character. His diverse work makes room for a wide range of antagonists, from human-like serial killers and maniac nihilists to supernatural ones. While people are familiar with popular entities like Pennywise from IT, there are others that can make for the worst nightmares. In this video, we have assembled some of his most twisted creations, the deranged supernatural madmen who take pleasure in causing fear and chaos. They have established a legacy in the horror genre, and so maybe it isn't the brightest idea to watch this with your lights off. Here, we have mostly stuck to the novel version and not the changes made in the filming. Before we get into the explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click from you, but it means a lot to us. Thank you. Let's begin. Could be someone's father. Kurt Barlow, Salem's Lot. Kurt Barlow is the main antagonist in Salem's Lot, and this powerful vampire inspired a TV miniseries as well. He moves to a town called Salem's Lot and wishes to form a vampire colony by taking control of the residents. He is an ancient evil entity that has existed before the dawn of Christianity, and his actions are discovered by a novelist. Will there be an end to his reign of terror? The setting is all too familiar for fans of King. It is premised in a small town, a place where he loves his stories to unfold. Salem's Lot was his second published novel, but it showed signs of a genius author. It was quite a challenge to work on the vampire mythos, but Kurt Barlow was the perfect villain to spice up the plot. The idea of a story revolving around a preternatural creature who unleashes the beast inside normal people was intriguing. <sighs> Barlow was, in many ways, a shadow of the iconic Dracula. Things like his coffin and native soil being shipped will remind you of the legendary vampire. Heck, he even had his own gothic mansion and a strange control of the residents of Salem's Lot. No, no. <sighs> He used them to strengthen his power on the town, and the urgency and dread surrounding him was pretty unnerving. There was a popular American TV miniseries that adapted the story, and it was directed by Tobey Hooper. The cherry on the cake was Doug Bradley, playing the role in a 1995 BBC radio drama of the novel. Pinhead infused his unique villainous mannerisms into this character, and it was a huge hit with the fans. What the fuck? Werecats, Sleepwalkers Mary and her son Charles are shapeshifting vampires who hunt for innocent, virginal women to feed on their life force. They are usually seen in their human form, but they can transform into dangerous bipedal werecats at will. These powerful vampires, however, have only one weakness in the form of cats, which can fatally injure them. In a new town, Charles meets a young lady named Tanya, whom he sees as a potential target. When Charles starts draining the life force of this innocent girl, the deputy sheriff happens to pass the area and apprehends him. Although Charles kills the deputy sheriff, his pet cat Clovis inflicts serious injuries on him. Mary tries her best to revive her son by kidnapping Tanya, but it is a bunch of cats to the rescue as the evil vampire is clawed and bitten until she bursts into flames. The werecats or sleepwalkers were an ancient race of vampires that were once worshipped as gods in ancient Egypt. These vamps survived by feeding on the life energy of innocent virgin girls, helping them retain their youth. They shared their origin with cats, but their vulnerability against cats caused them to be renounced as gods. Besides their shape-shifting abilities, these vampires also have powers of telekinesis and illusion. They can make themselves or anything around them invisible to others. Over the years, they have had to engage in incestuous relationships to further their bloodline. In this story, Tanya didn't guess the evil intentions of Charles and thought him to be genuinely in love with her. When she gets to know his real identity, she is desperate for help, and as the bodies pile up, Help comes in the most unexpected form. It is the cats to the rescue, and they can see through the illusion that the vamps create and cause fatal injuries to these evil creatures. The story is a well-constructed maze of horror and tension-filled moments that will appeal to those seeking a quick thrill. The Creatures, The Mist. A small town is ravaged by a violent thunderstorm. The next morning, a family visits the local town with their neighbor to stock up on supplies. However, they find that a strange mist has enveloped the town, bringing with it a horde of deadly monsters. 
They take shelter in a store, and now it is all about survival as more and more creatures fly in. While it may seem like a usual monster flick, the story also has a thought-provoking take on human nature in the middle of a life-threatening crisis. The so-called creatures or monsters that you find here are from an alternate reality, and somehow experiments conducted by the government to look into other dimensions brought about their presence. They are disguised by a thick fog that makes sight almost useless. They hunt using the scent of the victims, and in the novel, Stephen King hinted that they took over the entire world. The movie version, however, showed them only in a particular region of the United States, and eventually they were exterminated by the military. The film explores the depth of the characters and is an atmospheric nightmare with one of the most heartbreaking climaxes. The Lovecraftian horror blends with the political metaphors in a tense ambience that is created throughout the narrative. Among the deadly creatures, we must mention the arachne lobster that dissected victims with its claws, behemoth, the tall creature with six legs, the spider-like gray widowers, scorpion flies, tarot buzzard, killer kite, and finally tentacles from Planet X. <sighs> <laughs> Pennywise, it. A group of bullied and misfit teenagers meet their ultimate nemesis when Pennywise, the demonic clown, appears. They must face their own personal demons as they encounter a threat that consumes kids to satiate its never-ending hunger. You will just leave us be. I will take him. They call themselves the Losers Club and discover that the evil entity can manifest as their worst fears to prey on them. They successfully defeat him, but Pennywise is back after 27 years. Staying true to their promise, they head back to their old town and fight the evil clown one last time. Pennywise is an alien who eats children and lives in the sewers of the city. It is a cosmic entity that has been there since the beginning of time. It rises once every 27 years and goes around devouring the innocent children of Derry. It was once defeated by the Losers Club, who was a group of misfit teens, but decades later, the evil clown rises once again. We can never get over the scene where It kills the little boy in one of the most terrifying prologues in the history of horror flicks. While we mostly see him in his clown outfit, it has shape-shifting abilities that help it conceal its real identity. There was a successful two-part miniseries in the 90s where Tim Curry played the role. Later in the 2017 movie version and its sequel, the character was portrayed by Bill Skarsgård. A monstrous clown in a sewer with supernatural powers is probably the scariest villain that Stephen King could conjure up. The Night Flyer, from The Night Flyer. The Night Flyer is a short story by Stephen King that revolved around a cynical reporter named Richard Dees. He was investigating the strange, gruesome murders that were apparently caused by a deranged serial killer. Richard thought that the killer was mentally unstable, believing himself to be a vampire. However, he soon learns that it is the work of a real vampire, and when they come face to face, he is in for a rude shock. In the morgues, in the graveyards, in the faces of the dead and dying. The night flyer in the story was Dwight Renfield, although there is no way to tell if that was his real name. While we got introduced to his killing spree, not much has been provided in terms of his background. In the movie, we get to see his human form as well, and it suggests that he used to be an airplane pilot with a loving wife before becoming a vampire. The vestiges of humanity vanish when he is in his vampire form, and his pale, wrinkled skin is grotesque. His massive fangs could be used to feed on the victim's blood, and he also has razor-sharp claws. Your appetite for blood intrigues me. His blood had certain hallucinogenic effects if someone consumed it. He also possessed mind control abilities that allowed him to erase the memories of an encounter with him from his victim. This was one charismatic villain who could misguide his targets with ease. It is hinted in the story that Dwight had some respect for the determination of Richard while pursuing him. The climactic moments of the story in the movie will tell you a lot about his personality. Gage Creed, Pet Cemetery. Lewis Creed moves into a new house with his family, which includes his wife, Rachel, their daughter, Ellie, and their little boy, Gage. While the house is in a peaceful location, massive trailers whiz past the narrow road just outside. When their family pet is smashed under the wheels of one, Lewis takes the bizarre advice of his neighbor and buries it in an ancient Micmac graveyard. This used to be a burial ground for the Indians and has supernatural powers to raise the dead. To his surprise, Lewis watches his cat come back to life. However, the loving pet is turned into a vicious, half-dead beast. Later, when his three-year-old boy is killed in an incident, Lewis ignores all warnings and buries him in the same location. This time, fate is something worse in store for him, as young Gage comes back as a monster. 
Those who have read the novel will agree that even this fine movie version was no match for the horror that the book stored. In fact, Stephen King himself was apprehensive about the audience accepting such a dark storyline. Thankfully, he was convinced to share this with the world, and we had a horror classic. The most disturbing thing about the character of Gage Creed was that he was just another adorable kid at the beginning of the movie. To watch someone so lovable turn into a sinister half-dead entity with supernatural darkness is a sheer shock for the audience. He comes back from the cemetery in his changed avatar, and the innocent soul is lost to the evil version of him. Miko Hughes, who played the role in the movie, was brilliantly casted, and he pulled off both sides of the character perfectly. Stephen King does well to provide an adequate backstory regarding the cemetery, which the cannibals once used as their burial ground. We will never forget the petrifying moments that follow as Gage Creed unleashed his ruthless attacks. You wouldn't look at kids the same way for a couple days after watching this. Rose the Hat, Dr. Sleep Those who are familiar with The Shining are aware of the wonder kid Danny, who managed to survive the horrors of the Overlook Hotel. Now, Danny has grown up and is still dealing with the trauma of his childhood. He finds a girl named Abra who is struggling with her gift of the shine. She is being stalked by an evil vampire in her murderous True Knot clan, and the only chance they have is to team up and use their powers to the fullest. The evil cult wants to become immortal by consuming the shine of innocent people, and they're after Abra to eat her shine. <laughs> Danny is even willing to go back to the Overlook Hotel to protect her, but what does Room 237 have in store for him this time? Rose was portrayed as an immortal energy vampire who was the leader of the murderous cult called True Knot. She hailed from the 18th century, but her psychic energy and supernatural powers preserve her eternal youth. This ethereal and manipulative vampire was always hungry for more victims to torment. She was a vicious killer and wouldn't shy away from torturing and eating little children as well. Don't go by her looks because underneath the beautiful appearance lies a heartless monster. The climactic moments of the novel are blood-soaked violence that has Rose claim one victim after another. The Creep, Creep Show. Creep Show was the screenwriting debut for Stephen King, and this well-made horror anthology was very entertaining for the fans. Directed by George A. Romero, the movie comprised of five stories, two of which were taken from Stephen King's massive short story collection. It starts off with a young boy named Billy being punished by his abusive father for reading the horror comics Creep Show, and in the course of the stories, the little boy fights back. Later, there were two sequels to follow, but the last one did not involve King at all. The host of horror anthology couldn't have been any scarier than the creep in Creepshow. He has various forms that kept changing in the course of three movies that he features in. In the first, he appears as a robed and hooded skeletal figure with flowing white hair. The second was him in a jumpsuit mailman costume. And the third one shows him as a hot dog vendor who slices up a dog into pieces to sell to people. We first saw him appear at the window of a little boy and present to him five scary stories. The role of the little boy in the film was played by Stephen King's son. For many, the creep is only a harmless storyteller, but his appearance did inspire fear in the audience. He also takes up a minor role in the stories and often influences the outcomes. We loved the way the creep revealed himself with his iconic cackling laughter. Cujo from Cujo. The plot is premised in the favorite fictional town of Stephen King, Castle Rock, Maine. This was unlike many of the paranormal storylines that the legendary horror writer was known for. It was more of a psychological thriller this time around, and the antagonist was a St. Bernard dog that contracted rabies and lost its mind. The Trenton family had moved to the region recently, and Vic Trenton learned about his wife Donna's affair in the midst of the failing business. When he is out for work purposes, the rabid dog attacks his wife and four-year-old as they are stuck in the car. The maddening heat kills the little boy from dehydration, and the crazy dog kills the abusive neighbor and his friend. Eventually, the dog is killed by Donna, and she survives even after being bitten on her stomach. Cujo is more of a tragic villain, an adorable dog turned into a vicious beast by no fault of his own. He is portrayed as a friendly and playful companion before things take a horrifying turn. He was bitten by a bat and contracted rabies, which turned him into a vicious killer. Cujo delivers a few brutal deaths by biting the faces and necks of the victims or mauling them to death. In the book, the author carefully clarifies that the dog had no malicious intent and was merely a victim of circumstances. 
it leaves you with a heavy heart, and you will find yourself feeling for the previously kid-friendly canine that met with a tragic end. <laughs> Randall Flagg, The Stand when Stephen King wrote The Stand, he tried to replicate the brilliance of the spirit of the Lord of the Rings in a contemporary American setting. The story is premised in a post-apocalyptic world, where a strain of influenza has killed most of the global population. The survivors are constantly trying to figure out a new world order and battling it out amongst each other. There are various groups and new social systems in this political plot where conspiracies are hatched. The novel went on to be hailed as one of his best works and sold over 4.5 million copies. The complexity of the plot and the multiple characters has been handled beautifully, and ABC later broadcast a self-titled miniseries based on it. Randall Flagg is one of the dreaded villains in the story, and he is a master of sorcery, skilled in the dark arts. His sole aim is the destruction of civilization and causing conflict. Randall has some supernatural powers, such as influencing human and animal behavior or making prophecies. For many, Randall Flagg is Stephen King's greatest singular creation of evil, as he wants a new civilization that is set in his own dark ways. His manipulation skills are extraordinary, and he could convince just about anyone to fight for him. This character has been featured multiple times in Stephen King's novel, and we almost had a chance to see Christian Bale play the role in an adaptation of the same. Unfortunately, the project was cancelled, though recent production work was complete for another miniseries that will adapt the stand. This time, however, it will have a new ending that is written by King. Blaine the Mono, The Dark Tower The Dark Tower is the epic work of Stephen King that comprises eight books and a short story. Roland is the last living member of a knightly race that is called Gunslingers. He sets off to find the Dark Tower, the fabled building which is supposedly the nexus of the universe. World order has fumbled in the recent past, and Roland wants to find and protect the Dark Tower. In this quest, he is joined by a few allies and even mightier antagonists. Stop hiding behind your magic and face me, Walter! <laughs> Can the last gunslinger protect the tower and preserve humanity as it exists? Blaine the Mono was a computerized monorail that worked on artificial intelligence. It ran from Ludd to Topeka, Kansas in all world and functioned on Imperium technology. This pink monorail with blue interiors was starting to lose his mind after his sister monorail committed suicide. He had an insane love for riddles and this stopped him from killing himself. When he destroyed Ludd, he was seen engaged in a riddle competition with the protagonist Roland and his allies. They put an end to his crazy machine by pitching in with a variety of jokes that caused him to shut down and crash. This sentient train gone crazy had a huge role to play in the Dark Tower series, and only Stephen King could add a devilish touch to a tram. Crimson King, Insomnia, The Dark Tower Insomnia is a classic horror fantasy novel that is premised in the fictional town of Derry, Maine, where the events of It and Dreamcaster took place. The plot is connected to Stephen King's The Dark Tower novel series, and the story revolves around a widower named Ralph. He suffers from insomnia, and in his sleep-deprived state, he starts to see various things that normal people cannot see. Strange events in the town disturb him, and he soon realizes that his visions are more than mere hallucinations. Some terrifying forces are at work, and insomnia is now the least of his worries. Stephen King has suggested that all the villains in his fictional world are merely pawns of Crimson King. That should give you enough insight into the horrors of this deadly monster. Many people confuse Crimson King to be the same as It, the child-eating clown. While it is not made clear whether they are different, the superiority of Crimson King among his minions suggests that he is different. He is an intelligent creature with a homicidal urge, and his allies must serve him at all times. He was first mentioned in Insomnia, where this perfect embodiment of evil tried to kill the child who was prophesied to overthrow the rule of the king. Later, the character was brought back in the novel Black House and the Dark Tower series. The latter portrays him as the monster who tries to unsettle the structure of reality. It is unfair to dub Crimson King as a mere monster because he is the monster maker himself. However, he does have a lurking fear of meeting his end according to a prophecy and lives in a constant state of paranoia, slaughtering everyone around him. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone.